was interesting being here looking at things that probably haven't changed for 2,000 years. People come here and they trade kennels. And it makes you think back to the times when, say, the Bible was written, which would have been in culture probably much closer to this than it, certainly than to our own Western culture. Now, what's interesting about these cultures is that they have often a much more sophisticated and nuanced way of telling stories in multiple layers. And so if you read the Genesis texts, you see there's something which has lots of different layers of meaning. And it's actually interesting, it's the Western fundamentalists, both on the religious side and on the atheist side, that have kind of flattened it into a scientific text. And the problem with that is that it just does complete violence to the text. It wasn't taken to be a, a journalistic or scientific narrative. The minute you have images, you already have the beginning of narrative because you have the beginning of the shaping of the way something can be perceived. The minute something disintegrates, the fall of a rock, the altered movement of a stream, the changing patterns of a wave, they're all elements of narrative. And it helps us shape reality, it helps us actually grasp what it is that we're experiencing. Um, without a sense of narrative locked into our, locked into our DNA, the reality will be a great mess. Narrative is a very profound way of expressing truth and sometimes if you try to take it out of the story context, line up a series of facts, you lose something. You lose, you lose exactly the I bit that holds it all together. Yes, I yeah? would say you lose everything. Yeah. Every culture has a story of the world and our place in it. What in our rational scientific culture is ours? Do we still even have one? Stories tempt us into thinking that we understand and that we know on the basis of the stories that we tell how to deal with these problems, and they never do. And so we have to stop thinking about these narratives as having any other function in our society than Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Matters that give us pleasure and enjoyment and that move us. But now we know, when we compare those stories with the actual nature of human interactions, we should begin to recognize that for all their emotional value and for all their artistic beauty, they are not to be relied upon in the way science can be relied upon in order to order and arrange human institutions and cope with the vicissitudes of the future. You think science itself has a narrative which it sometimes thinks it doesn't have? Because scientists like to say, we've got facts. They don't so often say, but we also have a narrative, a story of science. Oh, I think science has a narrative. It's unavoidable. I'll give you a very simple example, because the whole idea of a wave and particle, I think those are two, actually, two great poetic ways of perceiving reality, um, the wave and the particle. So let's ask ourselves, what are spiritual truths like? Are they more like the facts of physics that you can line up in this very neat way and capture in an equation? Or are they more like the truths of story? Well, obviously the latter. The latter, yeah. I think that's what bothers me about some, some of what Rosenberg says. I think he says. was uncomfortable with the narrative descriptions he, because he thinks that we use them to fool ourselves. Well, I, I think he's right. I think we use the narrative to fool ourselves. But he thinks being fooled is a dreadful thing. I would say we fool ourselves in the sense that we'll just act as if this is true. And once we're acting as if it's true, it is. In that sense, that's, he's right. We fool ourselves. We fool ourselves into being better than our biology would allow us to be. In the scientific story, there's often no place for meaning. Can a sense of meaning, of the spiritual, or the moral, can they survive in the scientific story? 
I want to have a system that at least makes some sense of the world and connects it all together. And God plays an important part for me in bringing that whole of life experience together in a coherent whole. What would be missing in your world if suddenly you were to discover that there really just wasn't a God? I think, I think in, if there really was no God, then I would probably be much more on the side of Alex Rosenberg. But what would be missing in your life? What would have evaporated? Meaning and purpose. Really? Yeah. You wouldn't be able to hang on to those things without I, God? I wouldn't be able to ground them in any kind of way. I might say, I, I, so I would feel them, right? Yes. What do you mean ground them? What does that mean, Art? I would be able to derive them from first principles. It's not that unnatural so are you to then think saying without God you would worry that you were just fooling yourself that things yeah. meant things. I'd be I'd be very worried about it. I'd be tremendously worried. Really? Yeah, and I would I haven't been worried about it all these years. Mm. Oh, maybe you should be. <laughs> 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 <Cheers>. <laughs>
or someone discussing a problem with their wife or whatever. That has me both those things have meaning, and it's absurd to think that some computer printout or diagram of what's going on in the brain could capture the meaning of what's happening in a relationship or in a, in a musical uh, enterprise. So w when you think about it as absurd, nonetheless it exerts a seductive pull on people. I think if only we can get the, the data, that's, we've got to the essence of the phenomenon. And so that's in a way what, this, what scientism, as opposed to science, is saying. Trying to reduce things down to whatever can be quantified, measured, or put up in an overhead projector. One of my big problems with the reductionists is not so much that their method has not been extremely powerful. It has been superbly powerful. It is the hubris, the certainty that that's all there is. For Dennis Noble, the inadequacy of the reductionist story first struck him when he discovered that the heart doesn't beat because it is driven by the underlying pulsings of proteins, but rather because those pulsings are organized into a regular beat by the heart as a whole system. I'm not an anti-reductionist. I just think that you've got to recognize that there is an integrative process occurring in living organisms and once you have got a system that constrains the parts, it takes over. The system, the, the system takes over? Yes, because you've got something that constrains the components to, as it were, always go to a particular state. So the components build something, but once they've built that something, it takes over. that something then has an effect on the components that built it from there. Exactly so, yes. And so if you ignore the fact that that top level description is acting on the lower then level, you're missing... then you're missing a point. Well, then why are people so wedded to it? Well, because it is a powerful thing. For example, you figure out the molecular structure of DNA and suddenly it, it's very natural to think, well, that is so powerful, it must be the way of explaining everything. And that, only that uh, method. Only method. I, think, I think Dennis's point is to say, well, if you just use only that method, then you're missing something. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Because if I take the DNA out of a cell and I put it in a Petri dish with as many nutrients as you like, I can keep it for 10,000 years, it'll do absolutely nothing. It can't be the secret of life. Yes, so th this, this gets to the whole argument about are genes the recipe for life? Yes. Recipe is not bad. I mean, it's written down as a recipe, just like a music score is written down as a music score. But the recipe is not the dish. Yeah. And the, the score recipe, isn't the music. And the score is not the music, precisely. But for scientism's supporters, there is no escape from the harsh realities of pure reductionism. We're a hiccup on the way from one oblivion to another oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can't believe that. Yeah. Peter. Um, <laughs> we hope through the scientific method that we will understand absolutely everything. It's it's a wonderful challenge that you know the world is out there in all its complexity. We we little humans are tinkering with an understanding of little bits of it, but we're gradually migrating towards an understanding of the whole. What do you think the status of scientific knowledge is as it regards sort of other kinds of knowledge? Scientific knowledge is the only way of um, acquiring reliable knowledge because it's evidence-based and it's consensus-based and it's a, a, a way where you can be confident that the knowledge that you're gaining is reliable. Is that the whole story then, you were saying? Yes. That's absolutely. it, there's nothing, there's nothing more than that? No. Would that make us like computers almost? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I see nothing wrong with that. I mean, we're very elaborate computers. So, so I, I agree, I think we are chemical computers, but you're saying that's the, 
totality of the that's it that's well, what I don't see what else there could be um, it, on scientific grounds uh, well just on common sense grounds so how about people like myself who are religious and scientists what, what do you make of that religious knowledge is probably the paradigm of unreliability because, <laughs> because it's based on sentiment on authority and on wish fulfillment so I think you know the, those three aspects of religious knowledge undermine its reliability t- totally. Well, what about the arts and, then? Yeah, I was going to say, for a poet to say that they're providing uh, knowledge about the world is um, tolerable up to a point. <laughs> they're 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 pro- <laughs> they're providing uh, something to study. I, I think the core of science is imagination in alliance with honesty. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to be honest, without being imaginative, means that you're not very doing very good science. <laughs> being imaginative without being honest means that you're being a poet. So, um... <laughs> My definition of a fundamentalist... <laughs> There's someone who takes a partial truth and claims it's the total truth, and that's exactly the problem here. If you say that statistical physics explains a lot of stuff, there's absolutely no problem. If you claim it explains everything, including life, it's simply not true. And I think what is very important here is the following. My scientific colleagues listen to me and say, nevertheless, I believe If you knew everything about the universe at the time of the Big Bang, you could predict everything that's happening today. No, but no, do they really say that? I oh, thought yes. that went out a couple of hundred years ago. No, no, no. I've, no I've, do people really say I've that? Had, I've, I've had a Facebook interchange with a very, very <laughs> interesting colleague that's about crackers. who claimed this a couple of, couple of months ago. But, but that's untenable. Surely then he's saying the reason that you would say the answer to 2 plus 2 is 4 has got nothing to do with mathematics. Yeah, it's written into It's the... because some, some quark and an electron headed out from the Big Bang yeah. bumped it and it was always going to make you say 4. That's right. That's it's... crackers. I think it is ludicrous, the idea that everything that we would be saying, the idea that the theory of relativity and the Battle of Waterloo was written into the Big Bang, it is ludicrous. The thing about reductionism is that it tries to make the universe into a big machine, like clockwork. So, you know, there's this big engine behind everything. Then everything is explainable and everything is predictable. This is the ultimate determinism. And the consequence of this is that if everything is predictable, so is behavior. So is what I'm going to say now. And that makes us a prisoner of this machine. And that tells you that you are really not a free person, that there is no such thing as free will. And that's why the romantics were so pissed off at the scientists, you know, because they were saying, hey, it's all a big machine. And they would say, wait, wait a second, what about love and feelings and confusion and doubt? Where does that all fit into this new science you guys are talking about? That's not the whole picture. It cannot be the whole picture. And that is where reductionism starts to flounder. So I think Rosenberg, I would, I'm with him. If you start from those extreme starting points, that's where you end up. And I think if you want to argue that science is all that there is, then you should bite the bullet. And not kind of play some kind of game where you try to hold on to things that you like um, and also try to wrap yourself in the mantle of science. Okay, that sounds like you're painting me out to be the deluded. No, 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 no. I, I just think that you have other wiggle room, which I think but you I just to, think I but think you have, what, to move, you have to go beyond saying the physics is all that there is. Yeah, I, I think that's else. that's where I disagree with him. That everything's explained by by the physics, yeah. and, and it's yeah. all it's all reduced down to the the things at the bottom. 
because I think that there's atoms and molecules and there is no God. But I don't want to end up where he is because I do think the world has meaning in it and is meaningful. I think that's a very strong intuition that we all have, that life means something. And I, maybe one way of saying is that we should be careful of letting go of these intuitions too easily. So how can you and Rosenberg be in the same world? We just take the same logic. We just have very different starting points. And from our two different starting points, we end up at completely different places. He thinks I'm completely wrong. I think he's completely wrong. And you two of you think that I live where in some weird world then? I think I don't, we don't quite understand your world is probably the right way of saying it. <laughs> What I wonder is if the reason that the reductionist story of science rules out meaning is because it is in some ways very like the religious story it replaces. A belief that there is one set of timeless and perfect, rather godly rules, just without God. What could be more beautiful and true than to have an all-encompassing theory of nature where all different forces are really a manifestation of a single force. So very compelling. I mean, we've had 3,000 years of monotheistic thinking, right? And so we are kind of biased to look for these one explanations, these absolute explanations, right? You put the right glasses on, you would see that all that we see as different is really a manifestation of this single force. And so that's grand unification. Sounds awfully religious. To it me. does, doesn't it? It sounds like monotheism. Yeah. It sounds like God in a white coat. That's exactly what I think. Oh. I think that uh, even though I've, you know, I worshipped unification for many, many years in my career, I'm not like that anymore. I've sort of uh, moved away because what I happened? don't see the point. <laughs> you have two choices here. One is. It doesn't matter that it's not coming because it's there. And it's just a matter of time before we find it. Faith, you know, there is faith in science, obviously. And the other one is, let's listen to nature and it's trying to tell us something. And let's, you know, let's pick it up, right? Because as you discover more about nature, you become equipped to ask questions you couldn't even have anticipated before. And to me, that opens up this whole freedom of the surprises that come from the unknown. This is this, come and have a look at this art. This is basically my database for convergence. No one claims that reductionism is just wrong or that life isn't governed by the rules of physics. But there are scientists who are trying to pick up what nature is telling us, that life is more than just physics and tell a less reductionistic more open story of life. Which physicists say can't be done, exactly. but biology has said, has yes, we can. <laughs> One for the biologists. There we are. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So that's another, another example. So there we, go. there we go. I think there is very good evidence that through geological time, things have become more interesting, if you like, more complex. So far as biology is concerned, so far as Darwinian evolution is concerned, it is completely and utterly blind. When Richard Dawkins refers to the blind watchmaker, I absolutely agree with him. Evolution per se does not know where it's going. The processes may at one level be more or less random. It's a throwing the dice again and again. It's trying and trying and trying. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with randomness. The world won't work without it. But the world is also ordered. It's a paradox of how do you get this self-order emerging from what is originally, of course, just this sea of early particles and coalesces not only into planets and galaxies and all those good things, but also life forms, which in a certain sense begin to step out of physics and chemistry into new worlds. And the paradox, and I think it's actually an interesting question, is, you know, what is it about life? What is this thing, this sort of extraordinary thing which hovers between chaotic gas-like behaviour 
where nothing ever settles down to an immobile, crystalline-like form. And life in this sort of metaphor is sort of describes this incredibly narrow line, it's sort of tiptoeing all the way along like this. And yet it's that expression of the universe which then looks back at the stars and said, what on earth are we doing here? He mentioned this thing of not too many rules, not too chaotic, but something in the middle. I thought, I, I was sort of tempted to look over at you because I thought you, your fluffometer was going to go off and no, that you no, would say, no. oh, no, no, that's no, no, just too that's hippie, too that's too hippie I think there is something about life which is really extraordinary. So life is really, really different yeah. from crystals, completely different from gases. With so its we, own rules. Its own rules and its own set of, its own set of emergent rules, which are different. Uh, that's why we separate. asked him about yeah, that, yeah. but he was a bit cagey, cagey about that. Why? Why was he know, cagey about that? Because he, he, he all but said it. Yeah, I, think, I, I don't know. Maybe he's got bad connotations for him. I mean, the word emergence has been sometimes badly used, and so... By fluffy people. By fluffy people, exactly. But I think he was giving a description very much along those lines, saying yeah. he, there are these new laws that appear, yeah. and that you don't find those laws until you get to that new level of description. It's not as if it can all be explained by the underlying reductionist story, and that's it. I think in certain courses... When I was at university, you yeah. said that sort of thing. Yeah, but I think that was just because you were badly taught. <laughs> <laughs> So perhaps emergence is more respectable than I'd thought. Life undoubtedly has become more complex. The great question has always been, why? Darwin's answer? Was the selfish gene's competitive struggle for survival? But now this too might be only part of a more complex truth. Now we realize that cooperation is abundant in nature and it's kind of needed to explain complex life. So we have to ask the question, why is it that sometimes natural selection favors cooperation? Yes, because the simple view of natural selection would be if, if that, it, it, that it can't. That is where the mechanisms for the evolution of cooperation come into play, such that natural selection sees the advantage of cooperation, favors, favors cooperators over defectors. What Martin Novak has done in a computer model is to prove that cooperation can evolve against cheating and defecting. So here we have a sea of cooperators in blue and a single defector. Yeah. Tell me what you mean by cooperator and defector. The defector is selfish and, and the cooperator does something very strange because the cooperator yeah, generous, but kind of generous to a competitor, because everybody here is oh. a competitor with everybody else, and the cooperator helps a competitor. It reduces its own potential in order to augment the potential of somebody else. Which you wouldn't expect natural selection to allow. Yes, natural selection should basically make sure that those cooperators who do this strange thing, they, they get wiped out. So what happens? Yeah, let us start the game. See, yes, these defectors, they are spreading. You know, so the colors that we're observing here is red are defectors, the blue are the cooperators. Yes, the cheaters, red are cheaters, and blue are the cooperators, the good guys. And then we have these two other colors here, and that is green and yellow. And green are new cooperators in every round, and yellow are new defectors in every round. How do they manage to survive? They are like in the fabric sort of, of our universe. We have these cooperators and they survive because they form these clusters. And in such clusters, a cooperator is surrounded by other cooperators. And in those clusters of cooperators, they actually get a high payoff. So they do better? They do, they do better than the defectors that are surrounded by other defectors. So we always have to ask on the edge between a cooperator and a defector cluster, who is actually winning? because the cooperator, even though sitting on the edge, is still getting all the help from other cooperators inside, but the defector is sort of getting no help from his defectors. You have to ask, why does evolution not get stuck at a simple level, just replicating cells? 
Why does it lead to multicellular organisms? Why does it lead to complicated animal societies? Why does it lead to human society? And for me, the essence of this is cooperation. Do you mean you don't think those things would be able to evolve if it was just competition? Yes, that's right. That's exactly so right. Cooperation is needed for the complexity. That for cooperation is needed whenever evolution builds a higher level of organization. So I call cooperation an architect or a master architect okay. of, of complexity. I think this is what makes evolution creative. So, Arne, if you could take one thing away from the Novak interview, what would it be? Well, I think it's the idea that cooperation is somehow built into the structure of the universe. That's really interesting if it's true. Do you think it is? I think so, yeah. I think he's making a pretty good stab at showing that somehow it emerges from the basic laws of nature. That's surprising. So perhaps the reductionist narrative of one unchanging and perfect set of rules is not all there is. If there are new rules, like those of cooperation, does this point towards a universe where meaning itself could emerge? can divide the history of the universe into four ages, the Big Bang to the first stars, and up to that point there was no chemistry. And then you call the chemical age, which is when the first stars burn and create the periodic table of elements. Then you have the biological age, which is when some of these chemicals, you know, self-organize to create life. And then after the biological age, there was the cognitive age, which is when some of these living creatures became so sophisticated that they were able to ask questions such as the ones we've been talking about. What is the difference between the cognitive and the biological age? For many, the answer is morality. We used to see nature as red in tooth and claw, and to escape it, to be good people. Moral ideas in our minds had to override our selfish animal nature. But in fact, nature itself is what brought us to the cusp of being moral creatures. There was this obsession with competition and aggression and selfishness. And so our genes were selfish, we were selfish, and, and cooperation was a special case that we needed to explain. And, and we had a lot of trouble explaining it. That whole literature on selfish genes and how we humans are overly competitive and just like the rest of the animal kingdom, that was all a literature about psychopaths, I think. It was basically describing the human species as a psychopath. All we can think about is what is good for me and, uh, and, and very reluctantly thinking about what is good for you. And, and, and so there cannot be genuine altruism, there cannot be genuine kindness because there's always a, a selfish agenda behind it. And yet, Scientists have known for 80 years that chimpanzees are quite capable of overcoming selfishness in order to cooperate. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't buy into that at all. I think humans have all these tendencies. We have good tendencies and bad ones. Uh, and they're, they're all connected to our human nature and our primate nature. Uh, and you can recognize all of that in the chimpanzee as well. Not only can chimps and monkeys cooperate like us, but Professor Deval found they shared a strong sense of fairness as well. We set up an experiment with capuchin monkeys where one of them gets a cucumber for a task, the other one gets grapes for a task. If they both get cucumber, they're perfectly fine, and they do it many times in a row. If they both get grapes, they're also perfectly fine. 
But if you give the partner grapes, and grapes are 10 times better than cucumber, then the one who gets the cucumber still is, is going to refuse. And not only is he going to refuse, he's going to get agitated and he's going to shake the cage and he's going to throw the cucumber out, which is irrational because the cucumber was good before, why is it not good anymore? So we set up this experiment. Then a philosopher wrote us that it's impossible for monkeys to have a sense of fairness because fairness was discovered during the French Revolution. <laughs> Basically, th that tells us morality comes from a bunch of old guys in Paris who sit around and say, well, fairness would be a good idea, you know. <laughs> that, uh, and everyone, everyone else in the world went, oh my God, what a good yeah, idea. Yeah, let's spread the word on <laughs> fairness. It's a good thing, you know. And so that's how they think um, we arrive through reasoning and logic at a point where we say fairness is a good thing and then we implement it in society. But it is completely the other way around. Young children, two-year-old children already have a sense of fairness, just like my monkeys do. And, and so it's an emotional process. You compare what you get with what somebody else gets. I was wondering in that experiment, did the, did the, the monkey who was getting the cucumber sometimes just look at the one with the grapes and say, hey? No, that's chimpanzees will do that. <laughs> the monkeys have a sense of fairness that is at the level of a, of a two or three year old child. But the chimpanzees, yes, in chimpanzees you may have a situation that the one who gets the grape will refuse the grape till the other one also gets a grape. That's terribly sophisticated behavior. Yeah, but they do that in the field also. This more complete view of our primate nature was already clear to Jane Goodall. Perhaps because rather than look at chimpanzees through the lens of a predetermined scientific theory, she chose instead to live with them in their world. When I got to Cambridge to do a PhD, I hadn't been to university at all. Okay. And I was pretty scared. You know, yeah. but got there and was told by these erudite professors I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. Some really? of them said it's scientific to give them numbers. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't talk about personality, mind capable of thinking and certainly not emotions because those were unique to humans. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we're going back now to 61, it was still believed by mainstream science that there was a difference of kind between us and the rest of the animals. Yeah. What well, they were telling you, you have to be a spectator, an outsider, and not be involved. Not be involved emotionally at yeah. all. That distance would have prevented people from seeing what was true. Yes, of course. Yeah. For Professor Louis as a child, there was no such distance. I grew up in Gabon in Central Africa, and my parents are biologists. Um, we, we lived in the jungle, and the local uh, local hunters had shot a chimpanzee without realizing that it had a little baby, a few weeks old, still clinging to its mother. And so we raised it with a bottle that was at home. His name is Bertje. Here's a picture of us um, in the back garden. You and Bertje. Bertje, yeah. Bertje. I think he's about two, and I'm about four, or maybe three. So my mother says, although we look differently, we be behave remarkably similarly. You know, he, in the morning, we fed him porridge and he'd eat with a spoon. Yes. Which he didn't actually really like. So if you turned around, he would eat with his hands. Yes. And then when you look back, he'd grab a spoon as if, of course I've been eating with my spoon the entire time. That's quite clever, isn't it? That's really clever, yeah. So it's, he had a real kind of, he knew what was going on, he could sense things. And uh, I felt very attached to him. I really thought he was like a brother. Mm. And we played and, mm. you know, he, he was very... He liked to play hide and seek, and um, here he is with my sister. He and my sister were exactly the same age, and they had a, they had a very close bond that I was actually a little jealous of. Mm -hmm. like, we had some pet goats that also ran around the area, and one day one of these little goats was wandering close to him, and he jumped out and grabbed it, ran up into the tree, and just wrung its neck and killed it. And then he started poking out its eyeballs, and it was just... It was cruel. It was mean. I remember looking at that and thinking, that's bad. That's evil. And later I've thought about it and it's like, well, you know, was he morally responsible for that kind of gratuitous killing? For him, it was just sort of curiosity and yeah. what is this, this creature? 
I used to think they were like us, but nicer. Yeah. And then I realized that just like us, they have this, this terrible dark streak. But you would say they're not morally responsible for that behavior? Even I don't believe so. Yeah. I don't think chimpanzees or probably any animal is capable of torture, which I would define as premeditated, planned intention to inflict pain, yeah. mental or physical. Yeah. That's torture and that's evil. evil. So when you know, Bertje showed real, what I would consider loving behavior and he would hug you and uh, um, be very affectionate. Loving. Yeah, very loving. But then what happened to him? Well, so he eventually, he, he lived with us for a few years and then when he was about five years old, we brought him to a nature reserve where they tried to bring him back into the wild. So, um, but unfortunately he got ill at some point and, yeah. and he... And this is the tragedy of these humanized chimps. They can almost never be reintroduced. Okay. No, unless they're with a the whole group. Unless they're brought in as a group. Yeah. So what should we have done then? Because, you know, he was a few weeks old and he would have died. Yeah, well, no, you, you did the right thing. You took him and you, and you looked after him. Yeah. Young ones can actually die of grief if their mother, really? if they lose their mother. Even at eight years old, we had one. Just, just of grief, just being sad. It was just sad. depression, depression. Okay. We'd call that a broken heart if it happened in humans, wouldn't we? Yeah. I wonder if that's what happened to Bertie when he... When it he... could well be. I mean, he lost his whole family. Yeah. You know, he was abandoned. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That's the trouble. Yeah. And that's really tough. We interfere yeah. in animals' yeah. lives, but we interfere in each other's lives too. Yeah. 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 Wow. But yeah, you were you was, were his family. Yeah, and we left him we left him behind. I felt I felt abandoned when he left him, but I never until today thought that that might have happened to him. Maybe he died of grief. They they get, you know, the immune system weakened in that yeah. depressed state, same as with us. Mm. Yeah of a broken heart. There's nothing else you can say, really. It's really sad. Mm. There are a lot of sad You're things. Right. Yeah. I, I really loved Bertie. It was like a brother. And, you know. Well, this is the thing. They are so human. Mm -hmm. yeah, So we're animals, I think nobody just, we're, you know. Without a divine spark. Without a divine spark. But, but there's nothing beyond the fact that we're animals. We're no different from it. Yes, right. Nothing but unlike about. a lot of animals, we have thoughts. Yes, unlike a lot of animals, but like a lot of animals. Yes, but the, there's a qualitative difference in the thinking which is we are capable of than most of the rest. So in other words, I think yes, I just, we're, yeah. we're animals, but there's something has emerged in I our evolution. I just don't think I'm going to grant that. If you want to use the word emergent or irreducibly complex or evaluative, uh, then I think these are um, placeholders for questions on the agenda of science. At this point, we don't have a good handle on the details of the answer to this question that I favor. And you, holding an alternative view, have probably even less grounds for confidence. So, yeah. so David doesn't believe in God at all. No, no, but, but he does believe in the existence in emergent properties. Well, I, I, and do, I think and that, do you think that's something he should let go of, emergent properties? Yeah. So what, why? why? Or could... alternatively, I think you should treat emergent properties as a signal or a flag that indicates a domain or a terrain in which science has some work to do. Could there not be a proper science which did include emergence, so, which would be scientific? Yeah. When I look at the history of science, I look at the history of people drawing uh, lines in the sand and challenging science to transcend them, and science successively doing it. And people say, reduce this! I dare you, and science eventually finds a way to do it. There is, however, 
still some gulf which separates us from chimpanzees. A desire or need for meaning, purpose, even transcendence, that emerged in us at the dawn of the cognitive age. Did you ever see chimpanzees doing some kind of maybe religious type behavior or dances? Or? Let's say pre-religious. Pre so we have okay. this amazing waterfall at Gombe. Okay. You can hear it roaring. It's, it, it falls down 80 feet and there's a thundering noise as this rather narrow stream lands in the rocks below. And the chim chimpanzees sometimes do these amazing like 20 minute displays I call it a waterfall dance, wow. more scientific to call it a display, but they are upright and they're swaying from foot to foot. They pick up big rocks in the stream and hurl them. Wow. Then the time I remember vividly was when I actually was able to see the eyes of this male and he'd finished his display, his dance, yeah. and he was sitting on a rock and I was watching his eyes and he was watching the water falling and he was watching the water flowing away. And I thought to myself, you know, this pinpoints the biggest difference between them and us that we, what is this? What is this stuff that's always coming and always going and it's always here? Might not that lead to some primitive uh, early religion worship of the elements? Yeah. The, mm. you know, early man's curiosity as to what these things are and what they meant. But we can discuss it. Yeah. Therefore, we could turn it into that early primitive religion. The chimpanzee has the same, perhaps, feelings, although we don't know. But Not he can't quite, discuss. Yes, yeah. So although their brain cognitively is capable of, like, they can learn sign language, they can learn up to 600 signs or more, they can use a computer, they can paint, they can tell you what they've painted. They have a sense of humor, but as far as we know, they can't discuss something. Yeah, so it's almost the, 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 as if they're on the cusp of that. They, would, they might have intimations yeah. of something, but, but it's just out of reach yes. for them. Yeah. And these guys, like Betty, they, they become different because they're with us, yeah, yeah. because they're in a different type of society where we do use language all yeah. the time. There is more to us than biology can explain. And language is surely the key. It is in our ability to share language that meaning exists. Is this shared meaning enough to give us a moral compass? To understand that there is a right and a wrong? I don't see why I can't just have my biology, which is good and bad, and then dream up some nice ideas, like people are all created of equal worth. But the minute you want to say something like torturing children for pleasure is always wrong, you need some kind of other system to explain that, unless you think it's just dependent on the situation. Right? But I don't think you do. No, I don't. But I, don't I, but I would just say, look, matey, torturing children is a bad idea. And if you think it's a good idea, then you and I have a problem. But I'm not going to appeal to anything else. Right, so then it becomes your power versus my power, right? Because you will to cooperation. Yeah, I, yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but what's the way out of that? If you bring in and outside the idea that there are absolute truths, or there is a God, it's not because you think that's going to immediately cut through the muddle. It just is a try to way of demuddling the muddle. But it, it doesn't demuddle it. It does demuddle it somewhat because. Well, somewhat, for me, sorry. At least we both agree that there's something out there that we might need to obey. The incentives for me to follow that are I don't follow different. that at all, no. Unless you're saying that the extra reason would be you'd think that some bloke up there was peering over your shoulder and, and seeing you. Well, the extra reason would be because I believe it's true, right? Yeah, but I believe it's true too. I just don't try to... to what, so, you, so you do believe it's absolutely true? <sighs> but where'd it come from then? So, so, you, so you, you believe it's absolutely true? I don't know why you true? think it needs to come from somewhere. Yeah, but you can't just make things up. Why right? not?
might have one person who says, well, moral judgments are driven by emotions, and you have another camp who says, no, moral judgments are actually really uh, prolonged deliberative process, and I think they can be both. And I think, I think the field is generally moving away from this sort of false dichotomy. But if I run, could you be, uh, do you think, a, a, be a moral person if you were perfectly able to think about these deep philosophical moral, you know, this school of moral thought or that school of moral thought, but you had no empathy? So would, you be, would you be able to be a moral person or would you be a monster? <laughs> well, so are you d describing a psychopath? I don't know. I, I, Maybe. I, you, you put the label on I'm just describing this. <laughs> That <clears throat> it's just that, that I get the sense that we there's the, there's, there's the instincts and they're somehow a lower thing. And then we get to humans mm. and there's this, this fine ability of us to, to come up with great moral judgments. And I just wonder if mm. we've actually got the importance of the two the wrong way up. Because I think if you had empathy, but you didn't think about philosophical schools of moral thought, you'd probably be an all right person. But I'm not sure you would be if you were lacking the empathy to start with. It Moral behavior is, is motivated, and to have the motivation, you need the sentiments. You need to care about You somebody. need to care. So yeah. it's certainly the case, just anecdotally, that if you ask a, a psychopath, a serial killer, um, you know, do you know that what you did was wrong? They'll, like, they'll say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I realize it was, it was against the law. And I, you know, they can apply moral principles. They can tell you what you want to hear, but they don't have that feeling. It doesn't mean anything to Right? You. And so you can talk about physics, and you're a physicist, so E equals MC squared. I can tell you that E equals MC squared, but I don't actually understand. Why is the C squared, for example? Whereas you have an understanding, based on your knowledge of physics, that is a much richer understanding of that equation so similarly, a psychopath can say killing is wrong, and I can say killing is wrong, but our understanding of that statement is very different. So psychopaths are basically people who understand the rules, but don't have the sentiments to make them follow the rules. Exactly, exactly. I see what I really liked about that. I've, I really liked her emphasis on moral sentiments. That okay. it, was, it was more about how people feel and that that was the basis rather than intellectual moral codes. Did you get that? Well, I don't think she said it, it was that versus the other one. I think she is saying, you know, it's, it, yes, the instincts are there, yes, they're very important, but they're intertwined in a very profound way with how we make moral decisions and moral judgments. You can't talk about some affections being good and some of them being bad unless you believe there's such a thing as good and bad. And where does that come from, right? I think I, I can have a, a notion of this is good and that's bad, but not because I believe in, in a God or that there's an absolute no, good but, but or bad. You're misunderstanding what I'm saying. Oh, okay. So as long as you're instinctively not really thinking about them too much, that's fine. But when we as a society, as a whole, start thinking about it, so we're trying to work out, well, why should or should you do this? Or when somebody challenges it, mm. and if there's no good reason except that I feel this way, if a psychopath says to you, I don't feel that way, on what basis do you tell the psychopath that they're wrong, right? Yeah. If, you're, if the basis of your, of your morality is that you feel this is good. If somebody says, I don't feel it's good, then it's gone, right? There has to be something higher than that. It tells the psychopath. Well, you have you ideas. You can, it's not just, I feel yeah, this. Exactly. I mean, that might and, be and, the and, basis and, of my yeah, ideas, yeah. but I then have an yeah, idea. Yeah, exactly. And then the question is, are those ideas right or wrong, right? So is one plus one equal, to, you can say, I've got the idea that one plus one equals three, but that idea is wrong, right? <laughs> Fair enough, yes. Yeah, so is one plus one two, right? Is yeah. there, so the question is, is, oh, it, is, is it something like moral? Is something in the yeah, end like moral? Like one plus I, one equal two? Do right? you really think that that's the case? Do so you, here's what I think. Uh, this is where I think Molly really helped me clarify something because I think if I say to you, yes, there are moral facts like one plus one equal two, everybody, including myself, gets nervous that I'm mm. going to start to becoming doctrinaire and imposing myself on other people, actually causing harm. Yeah. So what I would really like, what she helped me think is, I, I do think there are things like one plus one is equal to two. I'm not quite sure exactly what one is and quite sure exactly what Right, but you think there probably are moral what absolutes. Quite, what quite exactly what plus is, but I do think that they're there. I do think that I can get better at figuring out what they're like, even though I'm always going to be careful that I haven't quite got it. Right? And the minute I think that I know exactly what one is and exactly what one is and plus means and I get two, then I'm going to be nervous because somehow, even though these things are real, they're just harder to grab. 
you know, mathematics is easy compared to morality, right? Yeah. Yeah. Moral yeah. Mathematics becomes really easy. So, I'm a theoretical physicist. I use mathematics in physics. And it's rock solid. It's just something you can base but things on. The fact is, physics is a lot easier than morality. <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> just a lot easier. Yeah. That's, for the That's reassuring. Yeah, yeah. So, I've, so physics people go, oh, physics is hard. No, no, no. Physics is easy. Morality is hard. Yeah. It's hard to know. But doesn't but the fact that it's hard doesn't mean that the truth is not there and that there's something that we can look for. Yeah. So how do moral truths form in our mind? Do they grow simply from our emotions and experiences? Or are our ideas themselves shaped as our minds encounter absolute moral truths? Can the truths of morality, for example, that compassion is required of us, that cruelty is wrong, can those be reduced to or explained in terms of the laws of physics? Pretty clearly not. Can they then be explained in terms perhaps of biological drives? Well, again, I think not, because there's something about genuine moral truth which exerts a pull on us, which exerts a demand on us, whether we like it or not, almost irrespective of how we feel, what we would like to do. Now, either you explain those away as illusory in some way, or you have to acknowledge there's a part of reality which isn't just configurations of particles interacting. So someone might say that, you know, we could explain these moral sense we have, even the, the, the feeling of being compelled on maybe an evolutionary ground. So we've evolved this way because it makes us better at cooperating or better at surviving, really. If you take a kind of biological view, as, which, as you were suggesting, then it so happens that we've evolved certain inclinations. But had our history, our social or biological history, gone slightly differently, we would have different ones. So compassion might not be right. Cruelty might not be wrong, if it had things gone a bit different. Now that, that seems strong, at least to me, seems strongly counterintuitive. Are you sort of saying that it is a moral compass? Precisely. Okay. So even if I uh, incline to be cruel or inclined to be destructive, or selfish. The, I, I'm, as it were, pulled. I think the compass analogy is a very good one. I, I, I'm not, of course, forced, because we often do turn away from the good, unfortunately. But you know it's there. But we know it's there. There's an analogy, I think, here with mathematical uh, reasoning, that we often do go wrong, we often make mistakes, but we have a strong sense that there is something that, that's the right answer in principle, and that our reasoning, however faulty and shoddy, ought to be conforming to that. And I think it's exactly the same in, in morality. The question is, if language merely allows us to invent truths, such as moral truths, that we want to believe, or discover truths which just are, How about people who say, well, you know, these things are just socially constructed? Right? Then you're back with that problem of had society developed slightly differently, we'd have to say, then cruelty might not be wrong. You know, oppressing the weak might be good. And that just sounds wrong, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, but you're suggesting that maybe moral truths are woven into the fabric of the universe like mathematical ones? Well, I think I would say that. That's to say, there's something in the nature of reality which makes these truths necessary. Not, of course, in exactly the same sense as logic and mathematics, but I, I would say that they are like boundary stones which our thought can um, overflow but not shift. Um, so, uh, in the same way, I think the, the moral truths are, come pretty near to being necessarily true. And then you have to ask, 
what makes them true. You could just say, well, they're just true and nothing makes them true. If you don't go that route, I think you, one is drawn, I'm certainly drawn to saying there's something in the, they're somehow grounded in the way the cosmos is. And that leads to a more religious interpretation, perhaps. So this is something that he, you and I probably share, which is that we think our, the morals are grounded in some way in something transcendent outside of ourselves, God. Whereas David doesn't believe in God, but he does want to hold on to there being moral truths that are independent of ourselves. Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I do have a sense that there are things which are, were true before we imagined them. So then I don't think you have that many options in, 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 in uh, describing going, or accounting. You're ganging up on me. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just that either you've got to say, well, they seem like impressive, authoritative requirements, but really they're just disguised preferences, something like that. Or you have to say they're just wafting around uh, in some abstract realm. I'm guessing you don't like that, the uh, wafting around well, option. I think, I think you like wafting. <laughs> no, no, that's not fair, I don't. Or they are grounded in some ultimate reality. Um, and that's so all those are my only choices? Because none of those three options seem terribly appealing. Mm. I don't know, I, I mean... That's a joke, I think. I don't know, mm. yet. The physical world around us does not depend on us. It exists, and we are merely in it. Could the world of ideas, including moral truths, be the same? Not something we invent, but something older than us, that we explore. You can explain all of the properties of the brain in terms of the physics of the molecules, the neurons, and all the rest of it. But you can't explain the ideas in there. It isn't even conceivable you could do that. There's the mind and the brain, and the, the mind inhabits the brain. Some say, or thoughts, let's say take talk. Thoughts inhabit the brain. And thoughts are not physical things, thoughts are abstract things which get represented in a physical way. So then, of course, the old philosophers of mind would say, but you're talking a dualist position. My answer is, yes, I am. If ideas are not simply determined by the world of matter, but instead can act upon matter, then we are more than just chemical computers. We would be as we have always felt ourselves to be, creatures whose joys and thoughts matter. Abstract entities are driving the physics at the bottom level. The physics is not controlling what happens. And from my viewpoint, existence isn't just physical existence, there's these abstract existences. So then you, you, you should ask me in philosophical terms, how do I justify the word existence? And I've got a very simple answer to that. I've got in my hand a pair of spectacles. Now, how did that come into existence? Someone had the idea of a pair of spectacles and then created these by a machine and so on. If they hadn't had that idea, this wouldn't exist. So that idea has to be real too, even though it's not a physical entity. So that realm of ideas you're talking about, you would say that came into existence in the Big Bang along with... I, along I, with the, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it came into... I, I think it might in some sense pre-exist the Big Bang. Oh, OK, pre-exist. But, it, but, pre -exist. It, but it, it, it exists. So then what natural selection is doing was creating more and more complicated minds or brains rather which eventually and at some point they they can access yes, this realm that is correct that is correct and so that thing that space of abstract stuff was sitting there waiting to be discovered yeah. and eventually minds reached a sufficient complexity that they could discover it but that space doesn't need minds to exist it's there it's yeah. there already yeah more than any other animal human beings shape the world they live in not just the things made by our hands, but those made by our minds as well. 
And then these objects and ideas shape us in return. But are all the ideas in our mental world only those we have made? For Professor Louis, the answer is absolutely not. Not because of his belief in God, but because of his study of mathematics. And if the mathematics was just a game that we played in our heads, then maybe you could say we made it up, like we made up the rules of chess. Yeah. But in fact, mathematics has this really extraordinary hold on the physical world. It allows us to peer into the physical world much more deeply than we feel we ought to on just on the power of our own brains. Mathematics is like this yeah, well, magical we just... telescope that allows us to see way, way, way further. And so that suggests that it's been out there all along. And so you feel like you discover it. It's still, it's there, still there, regardless yeah, of yeah. us. It was there before we came along. Well, exactly. Mathematical ideas, I think, are things which are in a sense out there. Even though we, you know, ideas are things in our heads in a sense, they're our own thoughts. But suppose you're trying to prove some mathematical result. There are lots of ways of arriving at the result, and there's an element of what you might call invention there. Okay, but the destination you're getting to already exists. That's the way I would view it, yes. And right. there's a degree, you might say, how can something have a degree of existence or not? Well, I think it's true in a sense, you could, you could, you could do this. You could have certain ideas which in mathematics have a deeper existence than others. And you can maybe invent various mathematical schemes, you could say, and I'll use the word invention there because, you know, they might be interesting to play with. But then some of these have features which reveal deep truths which you had no conception of before. And I think that the best example I can think of is the idea of complex numbers. I, which is a so-called imaginary number, it's the square root of minus one. Now you see these come about from the crazy idea that the square root of minus one exists, if you like. If you have a negative number and you square it, you get a positive number. If you have a positive number, you square it, you get a positive number. So how can you get a negative number when you square it? <laughs> well, you have to invent something. So if you want to know what the square root of minus one is, well, we call it i. Well, that looks like a pure invention. Yes, it does. <laughs> now, you see, the thing is, Imagine. What's deep about it is that if you introduce this notion, which at first sight looks like an invention, you, it unfolds an entire world that you had no conception of. And you didn't invent that. That came as a gift. Now, you see, there's an additional piece of mystery or magic here too. Not just does it open the world of mathematics and give you insights in all sorts of things in mathematics that you hadn't got before, then along comes quantum mechanics. And this quantum mechanics turns out to be fundamentally based on these complex numbers. And if you didn't have this idea, the mathematical idea of imaginary numbers, you couldn't do quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tells us that the world is based on these strange numbers. It's, it's, the, it's the door opens up into this world, and the world is, it's a huge garden, if you like, with incredible things wherever you look. You wouldn't have the door, that's the gate to that, to that world. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. So they were there before we even thought of them? They've been there since the beginning of time. These numbers are embedded in the way the world works at the smallest and, if you like, most basic level. So they're woven in to the fabric? They're very much a centrally part of the fabric. The fabric couldn't exist without them. When you've told me in the past about mathematics, just existing. And when I was listening to you in Penrose, that it's something you are not making up, you're discovering. It does seem right. But the problem is, once I saw you and Roger putting little squiggles on the blackboard, I then looked at those and I thought, wait a, wait a minute, how do they exist? Yeah. What's well, a non-material reality? 
See, I can cope with that when you say, well, it's the realm of ideas. Yeah. Because that's obviously true. There's a whole realm of ideas and I wander around it. We all do. But then when you say some of those ideas, they're just part, they're, they're part of the universe, just like Mars is part of the universe. That starts to get more difficult. Yeah, it's, it? yeah it's, it's, if you only think about real things as physical objects, yeah. then it seems strange. But you know, why would idea you? Ideas are definitely real. Yeah. It's only this notion that some of them... Well, because well, ideas are things you made up. Yes. But, but these are things you didn't make up. They're just real. They're just in the universe. The idea of a non-physical reality can have a quasi-religious tone. After all, for the scientific atheist, there can't be anything beyond physical reality. But if the truths of mathematics don't depend on atoms and molecules, then those truths are non-material and must exist in a dimension separate from the physical. So I say 1 plus 1 equals 2, but the fact that 1 plus 1 equals 2 is independent of whether or not my brain does those things, right? So the mathematics is true regardless of whether it, bosons or fermions exist. Isn't that, is that right? Yes, and, and there I think you have the, the major problem on the research program of scientism. The scientific worldview I think has very good answers to a huge range of the questions that really trouble human beings when they can't get to sleep at night and they're looking up at the ceiling and wondering about themselves and their place in the universe. The domain in which we have the most trouble is the nature of mathematics and our knowledge of mathematical truths. As you just said, it looks very much like mathematical truths are true independent of anybody's ever having thought them Many people are inclined to think that mathematics is just, you know, ideas in the head. But it can't be for a lot of reasons. And we've recognized this ever since Plato. Okay? And the one thing that we, scientistic philosophers, don't yet have a good account of is how we can have knowledge of mathematics. Because we think that knowledge is a causal process that involves an interaction between us and the objects of knowledge. And two and equals and prime number, these are abstract objects that do not exist in space and time. And so our knowledge of mathematics is a deep mystery. So you, you've written that you're suspicious whether a naturalistic program would be sufficient to encompass all of human reality. By which I think naturalistic, you mean one that assumes that there's only atoms and molecules and nothing else. What does that mean? Do you think there's, do you think, are you saying basically we need God to explain this? We don't need God okay. <laughs> to explain this. Okay. It might be useful to have God, yeah. I don't doubt. Um, but I think the, 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 the program runs into the buffers, the naturalistic program, in my opinion, with the question of consciousness. It seems to me that once again, mind goes full circle into what is the nature of mind? What are our brains actually doing? How is it that completely abstract concepts, which so far as we know, should only exist in our brains and by implication our minds, have such extraordinary traction? So they're not just, you know, formula on a page. You apply them and things happen in the real world. <laughs> Other people would say, no, no, mathematics is merely human inventions. Uh, and there's no, there's no decision here, but it's more or less what program do you want to start to subscribe to? What do you think is going to be the most fruitful? It's not that that view is right and this view is wrong. Certainly not. It's more where are we going to get the most exciting advances? And my suspicion is that the naturalistic program takes you a very long way but it doesn't take you far enough. Mystical though it may seem to believe that truths exist in their own dimension and that the structure of ideas in that dimension affects how our world works, there is evidence that this view is sometimes the more fruitful. The most famous example 
being the equation discovered by Paul Dirac. This Dirac equation is the first really pure example of predicting something completely new, a new type of matter, just on the basis of mathematics. In 1926, Erwin Schrodinger just came up with quantum mechanics, which is the theory of very small things. And so Dirac was thinking, well, what happens if I take quantum mechanics, the theory of very small things, right. and I make something small move very fast? Well, if it moves very fast, then it has to transform according to the laws of Einstein's special relativity. The only way you can mathematically make that work is by having a second particle. Right. And a little bit later, he identified it as the positron. A Positron is antimatter. He's he, he, imagining antimatter. He's not imagining it. Mathematics is imposing it on the world. Then that, that, what's so weird about that is that the mathematics says, if you look over there, this is what you'll find, and when you find it, this is how to work. No, Why, no, how no, does that work? If you look over there in reality, there's something that you've never imagined before, <laughs> yes. and when you look at it, it will yeah. do all these amazing things. And just, it just falls out of the maths. Yeah, it does just out of the maths. It's amazing. I mean, you see a very famous essay by the Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner, which he says, a gift we neither understand nor deserve. In fact, he calls it a miracle, although he was, an, you know, he was an atheist. He didn't think it was God doing something magical. Then what does that tell you? Well, so for me, it, it's in some sense a pointer to God. I don't mean it's some kind of proof of God, but it's something more like this. If I start from the assumption that there is a God, and then I look at the world, that's maybe not so surprising that something like mathematics would be woven into the world and be, allow us to predict things that we should never be able to predict. Whereas if I start from the assumption that there's nothing but atoms and molecules, it's very surprising that the world has this. this oh, it is surprising. I mean, I, I grant you that. Yeah. It doesn't. I mean, I'm not weird. It doesn't doesn't make you think there must be a god, but uh, it, it is so weird. It, you've got to come up with some answer yeah, because yeah, I don't yeah. see. It's extraordinary and amazing. We can agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> This is my understanding that when the universe starts, you've got just physics and chemistry. That's the level. Those are the rules of physics and chemistry. That's all there is. But you get more and more complicated chemical reactions until one of them creates DNA, the chemistry of life. And then suddenly, whoo, a whole new level, life starts. And then you get the evolution of creatures with more and more complicated brains until you get brains which can suddenly reach the level of ideas, which was always there, and then that new level opens up. The idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's true independently of the physical reality of atoms and molecules and quarks. And, and has molecules. a downward causation. And has downward causation. So that existed for all you know before those things ever came into being. But, sure, but for sure, the fact that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 is not caused by atoms and molecules interacting. It's rather the other way around. These mathematical laws have causal power on how the laws of nature right. behave. So eventually what's interesting about these levels of emergence is you get to this level where we have mind, which can then access these eternal truths. Once so, you have access to those ideas, that's something that wasn't there in the atoms and the molecules. So the atoms and molecules didn't cause 2 plus 2 to equal 4. So once your mind can access those ideas, then those ideas can have an impact on how you behave and that has an impact on the lower levels. I mean, the mathematics that I've discovered existed before I was born right. and exists whether or not I believe in it. It's actually just there. Right? Right. And so once you realize that there are things like that, then it, it, it undermines this purely physicalist idea that there's nothing but atoms and molecules because you've got to explain where these, these relevant ideas came from yeah. or where these relevant ideas sits. And obviously it doesn't sit in any part of the physical world. It's a non-physical reality. And so for me, as a theist, I think, well, you know, if there are mathematical realities out there that are non-physical, why could there not be other realities out there? Doesn't it also mean then that you're thinking that at least some of the ideas in this realm of ideas, they're transcendently true. They're, they're ideas that God put there. Probably, yeah, yeah. 
And if I don't believe that, then I've just got a realm of ideas which somehow is there. I admit it's not terribly satisfying. Yeah, but it's, a, but it's, it's possible. I can't prove that you're wrong. But I find it logically less compelling. Whereas you, I think, find the idea of God emotionally less compelling. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. It's exactly that. That's how, we, that's how we differ. If there is a dimension of ideas, why shouldn't moral or aesthetic truths exist there? And if they do, then for some, the most rational way to explain their existence is to believe in God. I believe in God, I'm a scientist, but David is an atheist. So do you think David is irrational? I think it is a more rational position to actually believe in God than not to believe in God. I find not believing in God slightly irrational. Why? It is a very, it is a very um, intolerant position because in some sense you would have to say, I know that in all reality there is no God. How, how can you possibly know that? You know, I find mm. that very difficult. No, I wouldn't say, I mean, I would just say, I don't believe in him because he hasn't spoken to me. I, I feel no reason, no need to. I, I don't say, I know he doesn't exist, because I don't. Yeah, if you, then you're not really an atheist. You know? So an atheist... <laughs> what am I then? In something like on the age of agnostic, a real atheist sort of knows that God doesn't exist. No, I don't know that. How could I? But, but, but I think you, th you think it's actually more rational to believe that there is a God than there is. Um, yeah, you have to say, for me, the reason to believe in God is really very philosophically, also mathematically, if you like. I believe in a universe that makes sense. Things make sense out there. There's the wisdom to study that which makes sense. But you see, I, I would agree with that. When I look at the universe, I say this is a universe full of meaning. And then the, the difference is, I don't feel the, the personal need to say, well, that must be underwritten by God, and I think God does. I think you're already on the right track, you know? You already say you believe in meaning, so now the next question would be, where does meaning come from? So where does ethics come, come from? Where does goodness come from? And where does it come from, Martin? From God. From God. From the fundamental principles. Exactly. It is like from the fundamental principles that are yeah. eternal. Martin, I agree, yeah? Yeah, I know, I'm feeling in the mind. I don't think I got mine from God, but I don't know. I, think you, I think you did. I know you do. <laughs> If there are, alongside the truths of mathematics, absolute moral truths, are these, not rational thought or science, what give us a moral north and south? Are they the moral magnetic field without which there would be nothing to draw the needle of our moral compass to tell us right? from wrong. What we both agree on is that science does not answer questions like what is the value of a human being? If you're using the word value to mean uh, some ultimate intrinsic value, then the answer is there's no such thing as ultimate intrinsic value. And so either the question is ill-posed or the answer is none. So I think where Alex and I agree, and we probably disagree with you, is that we both think that if the world is made of nothing but atoms and molecules, then such conclusions are inevitable. I, on the other hand, believe that there is a transcendent reality, a God, and that these kinds of values, like the intrinsic value of a human being, comes from outside the natural world. Right. But I believe that if you don't believe that's true, then you're, I think Alex's logic is impeccable. Now, I think that if you use the standards of reasoning, which you are accustomed to employing in the sciences, okay, that you cannot come reasonably to the conclusions that you just identified. Unless you can provide a good reason why you should cease to employ the principles of logic and the standards of evidence and reasoning that you employ in doing empirical science, when you raise these questions about the nature of value, uh, you're engaging either in sophistry or self-delusion. 
And I don't think that appealing, for example, to the existence of a supreme being, even if there were one, would help us in any way understand the nature of value. This just is self-delusion, mate. And just self-delusion, yeah. So, I mean, so basically what you're saying is if I use my logic, I should let go of the idea of God. And even if I have God, the idea that somehow that... It doesn't help. doesn't help me explain why human beings... Yes. So mm -hmm. even though I would believe that God created human beings and therefore their value comes from that, you're saying that doesn't actually help. I don't see how even if that Sunday school story were correct, it would help us ground moral value. Okay. I think I disagree. I thought you might. Yeah. yeah. No, so give us an argument. The, the argument would be that the morals that we have, or well, the value that we have, I think the, the idea that we're created by God gives us value. Mm -hmm. And that value is partially linked to the, the goals that God has for us, which are good goals. So all of the moral things that we have are linked. Wow. This is like, it's hard. I, I don't know where to start to deal with, the, with true theism. You know, that I can deal with deism because yeah. it's not a serious competitor to, to the scientific worldview. But theism is actually logically incompatible with a lot of science. And by theism what? you mean? I mean that God, that there is an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent and benevolent agency who's responsible for our presence here in the universe. Right. So he says classic theism is incompatible with science. Yes. But obviously it's not in some sense because you, you've yeah, got you both. You can keep both ideas in your head, but that's because we all keep contradictory ideas in our heads. We're not logically omniscient, and these two happen to be particularly obvious examples of incompatible well, ideas so you think it's dangerous? that many people keep in their heads. Yeah, well, and how do they deal with it? Cognitive dissonance, right. <laughs> being a bit schizoid in their personality. But maybe, schizoid? maybe that's well, a good yeah, thing then. Good. I mean, you, you, maybe if that's what we do and maybe that's the way we're evolved, then maybe it's a very good thing that... Or it that might be like adaptive, that. but that doesn't make it true any more than so many other beliefs that we have that are adaptive are not true. So I think he's on to something. If you start from science, it's really hard to bootstrap your way into some kind of why question. You just, at some point, it all dissolves away. And you, I think, you need something transcendent from outside of science to put that back okay, in. Okay, so this is where we get to it, because, <laughs> in other words, are you saying then that if you, if you, that you agree with Alex uh, Rosenberg, that, that sort of scientific, you says, you just start with the molecules, and if you're consistent with that and purely scientific, then everything that you care about disappears. And yeah, so yeah, that, are, is that why you, for you, there needs to be a God? Because that's the only way of bringing that stuff in. It's the only way that I can think of that's consistent that we bring that back in. We say odd because we're, I think we're brought up in a world of technology and medicine and computers that makes it feel like everything can be described by these little mechanisms. Well, you weren't brought up there though, were you? I was brought, I was brought up in a, world of forests and trees and wild things. Did that have an effect, do you reckon? I think it does, yeah. If you're brought up in the forest, you can't help but have a kind of spiritual sense. And I don't know if that's where it comes from, but I, I'm sure it played a role. So now, if you ask me, what, so what was it, you know? Was it the shape of the leaves or the wind? I don't know, but there's, you just feel it. And I, 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 I'm a scientist, I'm not supposed to say it. I just feel it. That sounds very unscientific. Yeah, so I was going to say, you'll get cast out of the fraternity for yeah. that. Ah. Oh. Ah. Was that good? There is knowledge, like scientific knowledge, where you sit on the outside and you're a detached observer and you look at it and you try to pick it apart. And there is knowledge which you kind of gain by opening yourself up to it and saying, I'm going to try to receive this. And I think in our own lives, relational, like the knowledge about other people, relationships are, have that nature to them. Our interaction with art or music has that nature to it. And I think our interaction with the spiritual has that nature to it. You're saying some evidence is not visible to you or you can't see it until you take almost like a step of faith. Yes, you give ground a little bit, and then something becomes visible, which was before occluded. Then, as it becomes 
visible, it has a further effect on you, you undergo further change. And so if things go well, I mean, this is what happens in a, in a relationship, if you go, there's a kind of upward spiral of change where people are prepared to put down their guard increasingly. And as a result, there appear properties of the other person which they might not have seen before. Once upon a time, in the jungle of Africa, there was a little boy who had a pet chimpanzee. And the name of chimpanzee was Berche, yeah. like a brother to him. One of the greatest ways that humans are able to take that step of faith from the narrow instinct of empathy for those we already know to a broader care for those who are still strangers to us is not through the facts of science, but through the meaning of stories. There are not that many ways of getting me to feel what you can feel. They're just not that many. Um, one of the few truly great ways of doing that is story. It, it's, it's, it is one of the most miraculous things about it. You write a story. Uh, one day I went out into the street and I saw this girl. And I'm reading it. I'm not reading it from your point of view. I'm reading it from my point of view. I'm reading it from my consciousness. So the act of reading is an act of automatic empathy. It is literally wearing someone's skin. It is literally entering into someone's consciousness. Forgive these absurd gestures, but it is a, an immersion into a different, um, uh, slightly different order of reality. Actually, one quite, quite different from yours. But suddenly you get to see it from someone else. And you think, oh my goodness, is that what that feels like? Um, and that's one of the most powerful places for the birth of the moral, of the moral sense. Because if we don't know what someone else feels like, why, why, why should I care really what I, what I do to you? How do we know um, uh, the moral boundaries of life? How, how do we know? If, if, you, if you live in a place where no one has told you, don't do that, that's going to hurt somebody. How would you know? We only know because people tell us. Um, and even when they tell us, we don't really know. We only begin to know when we can start to feel how the other person might feel. I was, I was a very selfish person on the street. I only thought about myself. I look back on my life and it was me, 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 and I don't need anyone else. They gave me 15 years for uh, kidnapping, carjacking, and uh, residential burglaries. I was living the fast life, pretty fast. I didn't, it didn't matter to me what or who or why, it was, just, it was just about me the whole time. I took someone's life and I, I received a life sentence with possibly a parole. I had been down 30 years. So you've been outside today? I count it as a blessing. I believe I was saved because I was, I was doing some bad things out there, not treating people right and it, uh, it ended up in me taking someone's life. So when I came to jail, my life started over there and I got back in touch with my religious faith and uh, it's graduated uh, to working here in hospice and I don't know if you can call it paying back, but I know I'm doing the right thing. The minute you begin to tell a story, the whole universe comes into being. Because uh, every, every good story brings with it a complete world. Even if it's very short, the implication of a complete world is in there. Um, and that's where the moral structure comes from. Um, because it's given the idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a complete world. So it brings with it the ideas of the society. It brings with it the, our perception of how things should 
should be, ideally, uh, how we would not like them to be. Um, I, all of our ideas about society are implied in the stories that we tell. Yeah. The imagination is one of the most extraordinary faculties um, that we have. It's not, it's not an objective faculty, even though it draws its material from the objective. Um, but it's, it's the faculty through which we are able to be slightly more than just ourselves. And for me, storytelling and imagination are in, in very in, intrinsically bound. Do you think that has a, an effect back on us? The telling of a story changes us. You know, that, do ideas have the, the power to, to change the person who... Absolutely. 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 The teller is changed by the telling. Um, the hearer is changed by the hearing. I feel uh, the patients are uh, giving us an opportunity to help them. Uh, they all have different needs, they're all in different stages of life, and it gives us an opportunity to get personal and uh, be open with them. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. And do you think your faith in God helps you with this? Absolutely. Yes. Why, why does it help? Well, because this is the end of life for them as we know it. But uh, we have a life after this. And I really encourage them to tell Jesus they're sorry. And he'll forgive them. And boy, what a what wonderful feeling it is to know that they may be in heaven. And so that's that's what I'm getting out of it. If the story resonates with you in any way, something has been not given to you or added to you, but awoken in you. Something has been inwardly. Um, expanded in you that wasn't that wasn't there before. I'm even going to go slightly further than this and say that I believe stories affect reality. I, I believe that the stories that we tell themselves slowly actually change uh, our, our, our realities, our possibilities. This is somebody's father, somebody's son. There's somebody, these guys are somebody, regardless of what they've done in their life or regardless of their, their crime. Uh, and I look at them as, as individuals, as patients, not as inmates, because, because we all need someone to take care of somebody. And taking care of these guys is it's just, it's, it's an awakening. I do it because I, it makes me feel good. It makes me, makes me want to be better and uh, it makes you want to give back. I think in a way there are truths that are only accessible if we're prepared to be porous, open, um, receptive. So there are some genuine realities which can only be accessed if you have the right kind of receptivity. If you always remain hard, detached, the spectator, that very insistence on adopting the scientific detached attitude will cut you off from being receptive to the properties of the other person. It gives a meaning to life. It gives a meaning to the spirit, to the soul. Yeah. And if that wasn't there, would it be more difficult or impossible to feel that there was a meaning? I think so. I think you'd be empty. You'd be empty. You'd be lost if you weren't connected with your inner, your inner soul, your inner conscience, your inner being. I think you'd be, would be lost. Do you hope that someone will do it for you? Hey, <laughs> I see myself on this bed maybe one of these days. Like Chaplin said, I'm 73 years old. I've been down 30 years. Uh, maybe I'll get out, maybe I won't, but if I have to end my life, this is where I want to do it. 
because I want to get care. The truths of science are the objective truths of our material universe. But how we understand the truth of human life and death is perhaps what ultimately shapes the questions that we ask and the answers that we seek. There's no point in worrying about what enjoyment you'll get when you're dead. There's no point in worrying about you know, what enjoyment you missed before you were born. Meaning is, um, I think, deeper enjoyment when you are alive. And we can see joy and delight and all those things that c contribute to the pleasure of being alive. I think it's such a privilege that um, we should make full use of it. Grasp the moment, carpe diem. In terms of science, one can hardly blame people for being so enthusiastic about it because it opens completely new doors into the way the universe is organized. And my only complaint with some of my colleagues is to say, is that sufficient? Everything else I know about the world, including many areas of science, is it's always unfinished business. And I'm just always nervous and this would apply with equal force to any religious faith, as it would to science, to say, everything is being sorted out, I don't have to worry about things. And so the problem is, is it actually sufficient merely to get some fantastically clever machine which will provide gigabytes of data if, in the end, we don't actually know what the question is we wish to ask? To say that reductionism fails doesn't mean that there is more to it than matter. It doesn't mean that there is some sort of soul or spirit okay. that is controlling stuff. It just means that science cannot do that job. Some scientists, you know, the, the ones that go push reductionism all the way to the end, they're asking science much more than, than, than science should be able to, to answer, which is to answer everything. And so this belief, because it's nothing more than a belief, really, you know, that science can probe into the behavior of everything and come up with final answers about who you are, or even about what nature is, right, is really, I, I think, a, a misunderstanding of what science is about and how science actually operates. So to me, you know, this new science, instead of saying, oh, the universe is enormous, we are nothing, we're just machines, we have no free will, no. We are actually incredibly important because without us, you know, the universe wouldn't have any meaning because there would be no one to think about meaning in the universe. Mm -hmm.